One by one, we came up with this program, and it's fascinating for its use in te technology. It's great because councils are already using it, and you'd be surprised how easy it is to import to your own local community if you say yes. So with that, I'm going to introduce Netta, who will introduce the group. Netta Ascoli is the program, Education Program Officer of the World Affairs Council of Northern California. She joined the council in June of 2011 after receiving her MPIA in International Development from the UC San Diego School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. I could go on and on, but she speaks three languages. We want to hear English from her today, not from me. Nada, come on up and tell us who you are and who else is coming. Hi, thank you so much. Hope you're all enjoying your lunch. It's my pleasure to introduce the individuals that will be joining me to discuss global education and specifically face to faith. So as already alluded to, you can't hear. Is it better now? Okay, great. Um, so as already alluded to, we have some great people here to discuss what you can do with this program. So joining us is Charles Haynes, the director of the Religious Freedom Center at the Museum Institute. We have Kristen Looney, who is the head of Face to Faith in North America, which is part of the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. We have Iyad Hussein Abdelaziz the, from the Islamic Educational College, who will be joining us live from Amman, Jordan. And with him, he's also recruited some of his colleagues to provide more perspective. We have Youssef, who teaches in a public school. Ghassan, who teaches in one of the leading private schools in Jordan. And then also Jinan, who will be joining us from Lebanon. And then we also have Craig Perrier, who is a high school, high school social studies specialist at Fairfax County Schools. So um, we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. I believe, Kristen, you're up first. Thank you so much, Netta. Um, it's an honor to be here today. And I'm thrilled that we can um, give you a presentation and talk to you about uh, a rich opportunity for global education uh, for youth who live in, in your areas um, and, and that you are already connecting with. I'm going to begin this by um, showing a video um, by uh, Tony Blair, who is the former Prime Minister of the UK. He is the one who created the Tony Blair Faith Foundation after he left office. And the reason he did this was he felt that, that religion around the world was, was greatly misunderstood. And he wanted to make sure that there were opportunities not only for current leaders around the world, whether they were politicians or educators, or whether they worked in the economy, no matter where the, the leaders, the current leaders of our nations around the world were, he felt that there just were not opportunities to learn about how faith and globalization impacts each other. He also wanted to make sure that university students had an opportunity to learn about these issues, and so he taught a course at Yale University called Faith and Globalization. That course now is being taught in 30 different universities around the world. But he also felt very, very strongly that young people, uh, that young emerging leaders needed to have the key skills of dialogue to be able to engage in difference, not only within their own communities, but with their peers around the world. And so I'm going to show you a video uh, with Mr. Blair talking about the great need for this type of program. So whereas in, in the 20th century, people fought over things like communism and fascism, big political ideologies and ideas which caused world wars, all of that has gone with the passage of the 20th century. But what's replaced it in, in the early part of this century is a clash between cultures. Where there's ignorance, there's usually fear, and where there's fear, there can often be conflict. By contrast, where there's knowledge, there is often understanding, and where there's understanding, there can be peace. Here, 
it's our duty as a as a teacher, as a parent, it's our duty to find this kind of safety environment for our children because otherwise somebody else they find a bad way to affect on them. What we get from people in other cultures is from movies or news. I did not understand them well and this face-to-face uh, -face program helps me understand them. Through face-to-face -face, I got a new perspective of um, different religions and traditions all over the world and you really learn to respect them when you can actually when you actually see them and speak to them because it's really easy to judge people and then you realize that everything you've thought isn't really true. I've learned how to be less judgmental. I've learned how to be understanding towards other people and towards their opinion. The video conferences taught me um, how to listen to others and simply dialogue. I think the first step is sort of allowing people to engage in this initiative and I really think it's important for people our age to get involved so that way when we're 35 or 40 years old and we can actually go out and do things that would make a difference, we're educated enough to do so and we can get more people involved so that way the barriers can be torn down, people really can engage in open dialogue. Success for our foundation is getting to the point where governments recognize that a fundamental part of a young person's education for the modern world is to be educated with an open mind to those who are of a different faith or culture. When I used to go around looking uh, at people, uh, they, they look different, they are different. But, uh, now, I've, I found out that being different is so special. This program, it changed my way to face life. I know that there's something more than just think about ourselves. The program changed a lot about me, about my personality, about my, my point of view uh, for other people. It uh, changes a lot of uh, my attitude, the way I approach people from uh, other religions, uh, from other cultures. Now I can communicate with people without being afraid, without just having these, these walls that, that I had before this program, uh, this fear that I had inside, because the, the fear of difference. Because of the program, I can proudly say bye-bye ignorance and hello world. We need to take what is that actually wonderful and beautiful innocence that children have towards each other and we need to educate them that this is something worth keeping, worth preserving for all of their life. Educating the next generation is the way to plant the seeds of peace. So we are absolutely thrilled to be able to talk with you a little bit about why this program is needed, not only globally, which Iyad will talk about that, um, but also locally here in the U.S. And um, Dr. Charles Haynes has been with um, Face to Faith and, and been a U.S. advisor for our program from the very, very beginning. Uh, we started five years ago, so we're still really in our infancy stage. Um, but we have worked very hard over the last five years to build a program, uh, to build for capacity, and, and now we're in 30 countries around the world. And we want very much uh, for more U.S. students to be engaged in this type of dialogue with their global peers. And so now Charles Haynes will come forward and talk about uh, the real need for this um, for our U.S. students. Thank you very much, Kristen. I'm delighted to be with you today, and I'm just going to take a very few minutes uh, to talk a little bit about why I got involved and why I think this is important. Um, but first, let me thank you for what you're doing. I, I mean, I, it's the obvious thing to say if you pick up a newspaper any morning, uh, sadly, uh, but your work is more important now than it's ever been. Right? It's vital, um, and you are, because you know that the Global challenges we face, poverty, disease, tyranny, war itself, we're going to need informed, engaged global citizens if we're going to tackle these problems. And so um, it's especially true 
however, and, and this is what Mr. Blair alluded to, and I think it's very important. It's especially too, true because to so many of these conflicts, <clears throat> so many of these challenges we face are, are rooted, grounded in religious and cultural and ethnic differences and, uh, and fueled by those historic differences. Um, they have political dimensions, economic dimensions, but often the roots, as you know, are those religious and ethnic differences. I mean, from the brutal campaign now being waged by ISIS, which is almost unspeakable, to, uh, to things like the persecution of the Rohingya Muslims in, in Burma, uh, the world is being torn apart by this sectarian violence and, as you know, causing incalculable suffering to millions and millions of people. Um, my own work is in religious freedom, and uh, I'll just say uh, the obvious again, but we need reminding that religious freedom is the key condition for creating a just and peaceful society across our differences. We forget this, I think, sometimes in the United States. And that kind of religious freedom, which gives people the opportunity to be who they are and to be also part of the larger community without violence, without conflict, well, that condition of religious freedom, which we sometimes take for granted in the United States, it's actually quite rare in the world, as you, I'm sure, know. Just to take one example of how this has been mapped, I'm sure maybe many of you saw the report released by Pew this year, the Pew Research Center, and it was about a 2012 survey that they did. And they found, and this is stunning to me, 76% of the world's population, fully 5.3 billion people, live in places with very high restrictions on religious freedom. Religious freedom is the exception in the world today, not the norm. And that is one of the reasons that is one of the reasons, and maybe a key reason, why there is so much conflict, so many people imprisoned, so many people being persecuted and, and, and killing one another. Now, thanks to the First Amendment, of course, uh, the United States is more fortunate, very fortunate. But I don't think I need to remind this audience that we are not immune from the dangers of religious division and uh, extremism. Take an example, anti-Semitism is very persistent in the United States. People forget this until some incident is in the news. But attacks on Jews and Jewish institutions are actually by far the greatest number of hate crimes reported to the FBI, if you look at the FBI statistics. Extraordinary. Uh, of course, Islamophobia, this growing problem that we have around the country where people organize to prevent a mosque from being built in their neighborhood, where Legislatures are trying to pass laws really aimed at, at, um, at Muslims, so-called anti-Sharia laws, and so forth and so on. And of course, the many culture war conflicts that are rooted in religious differences, religious worldviews, social issues that uh, divide Americans deeply across the country. Now, obviously, we, we, we have to act now on these fronts some of the things you're doing, but of course, the things we expect government to do, we, we have to have diplomacy, and of course, in some cases, unfortunately, we have military, and we need an informed debate on, on how to respond to these challenges, and that's part of what you do. Uh, your work is to help Americans understand the issues and, and to know what immediate action should be taken to face this great, great world question of how are we going to live with our deepest differences, how are we going to broker religious and ethnic differences. But I'm also very pleased, and that's why we're here today, that you're taking not just that immediate view, the short-term view, but you're taking the long view. Um, and that's harder. Uh, and and, and it's, it takes a lot of patience and actually some courage to take the long view. But you, like us at Face to Faith, we are committing ourselves to helping young people understand their responsibilities as global citizens. Because for the long term, the only answer, really, the only long term answer to training camps of violence, of terrorism, of hatred around the world, and rising intolerance at home are schools, 
of freedom, of justice, of peace. It's really the only long-term solution. I'm Jeffersonian enough to believe that education matters, but it takes work and it takes patience. So that's why we're eager to partner with you on Face to Faith. We can work together to connect young people from around the world. What an extraordinary opportunity we have in the, with technology now. Technology can be for better or for ill, but here's a case where it can really help us to connect young people around the world. You heard some of their voices, giving them opportunities to learn directly from one another. They believe it if they hear it and see it from one of their peers, as you know. Video conferencing, and then this online community that Kristen will talk about, extraordinary. So they're learning through this face-to-face -face effort about global issues. That's the focus of the conversations, about major global issues. And interestingly, they're learning how various religious groups understand those global issues. So they're learning about the key issues of the environment, the health and wealth, wealth and poverty, and so forth, but they're also learning about how different groups see those issues. But most deeply, they're using their voice. They are empowered to talk about things they believe, their deepest values and, and beliefs, and, and hear how other people, their peers, think and believe in other parts of the world. Now, I guess my role here today, because of the, the First Amendment and, and our commitment to, to those principles, is to kind of reassure anybody in the room, because in the United States, anytime you start talking about a program in education that has faith in it or religion, of course, a lot of red flags go up. So I guess one of my roles here is to simply say, this is very consistent with the First Amendment. Uh, clearly, uh, we can and must in our public schools, of course, religious schools, private schools, have different uh, ground rules, but in our public school, we can and we must teach about different religions and cultures and beliefs. We must, we cannot learn about history and literature and other subjects, but also we can't live with one another unless we talk about those things that mattered so deeply to people in the context of our academic program. And we can also, under the First Amendment, give students opportunities to express what they believe, whether it's a religious belief or a non-religious belief, whatever their values and beliefs, they should have the opportunity to really talk openly about these, and the key is not to just talk about it, but to teach them how to talk about it in ways that are civil and respectful. That is a critical role for the school. The school doesn't tell them, you know, what to believe, it can't and shouldn't, about faith or values, but it, it, it does tell them how to engage one another across their differences. Um, those civic virtues, if you will, that enable us to live and work together across our differences. So, in a deepest sense, this program is not only consistent with the First Amendment, it actually em embodies the First Amendment, the spirit of the First Amendment, because it empowers student voice, helps them to address differences with civility and respect, and, in my view, seeing it in action all these years, it promotes a commitment to religious liberty in these young people, for people of all faiths or no faith. When we first got this started in the United States, one of the first things I did, just another reassurance safe harbor statement, then I'll stop, is I got together an advisory council because I knew that if our public schools anyway were gonna take this up, they were gonna have to look over their shoulder this way and they were gonna have to look over their shoulder that way. And I wanted to make sure that when they looked over there, they saw the ACLU is listed on our advisory council and supporting this because a lot of people want to know, is this a safe thing for us to do and a valid thing? Then if they look over here, they want to know if the ACLJ <clears throat> supports this. And, and yes, they are also on the advisory council. Now you won't find ACLU and ACLJ on many lists together, but they're on this list. Why? Because I think that Dan Mack of the ACLU and Colby May of the ACLJ, who are the representatives on the advisory council, they understand across their differences that we, the United States need to take our differences seriously. We need to help our young people live with these differences and understand one another. And they need to, in, beyond the lawsuits and the culture wars, they need to support an effort that takes that long view of what kinds of human beings are we going to graduate 
to be global citizens in this world. So we're very excited to be working with you. You're gatekeepers to so many people who care about these issues in your communities. This is a program that I think fits perfectly with your vision and your mission. So thanks for having us today. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the nuts and bolts of this program. This program is free of cost. It is a program that is easy to use. It is a program that you can pick up and make work um, in, your, in your area of the country with your affiliate. You can make this work. And you're going to hear more about how it actually works from our experts who have been doing it on the ground. But I want to tell you what our program is so you get a bigger sense of it. So we are a program uh, that is um, really designed for students who are 12 to 17 years old. Why that age? Because the heart of what we do is we teach dialogue skills. And for students to be able to do the heavy reflection work, to really be able to think about who they are, articulate that, and connect with people around the world, we want them to have these basic skills. And we feel that these skills really are best used in middle school and in high school and with those students. Now, we're not only in schools. We're also in non-school settings. And certainly, that's where we would love to partner with you and we already have in in two parts of the country we have engaged students in over 30 countries which is really amazing when you think about um, we're only five years old we have engaged more than a hundred thousand students in video conferencing and on our online community and we have 1300 schools that are engaged in our program at Face to Faith, we empower young people from around the world by educating them about different faiths, beliefs, and values, including those of their own community, and then expose them through technology to a variety of different voices. And so we want students to think about who they are, what they believe, what is important to them, what motivates them when they look at the huge global issues that we have, and then we want them to connect and articulate that to their peers around the world and then to investigate how do their peers in Philippines and Indonesia and Ukraine and Egypt and, and Israel and Palestine, how do they feel? Where can they connect? Where are those similarities? But also where are those differences and how can they learn more about those differences? This was written by one of our students at Regis High, and I thought it was really interesting and pretty profound for a 16-year-old to write this. A citizen of the world is one who is not afraid to learn more about his identity. He understands that his culture or religion is not the only or most important one, and he appreciates and welcomes learning about himself through others. Even though it may be easier to surround himself with people who share his culture and religion, this citizen welcomes difference because he knows it will improve his knowledge of himself and strengthen his relationship with others. And that's exactly what we see, that as students take a time to really reflect on who they are as a person, what they believe, what motivates them, what's important, and they articulate it to their peers in different parts of the world, they become more confident citizens because they're saying what they believe, they're thinking about their identity, and then they begin to work together in how can we solve some of these issues. And the great thing is they're not afraid of that difference as they begin to build relationships with their peers around the world. So our program offers classroom resources on dialogue skills and global issues. When you go onto our online community, you will find a ton of resources that we have. We offer video conferences where we connect schools in different parts of the world. We offer a secure online community where teachers are first um, uploaded into the community. They sign up, they join and then they are able to upload their students into our very secure online community. So students are able to connect with each other, either formally through blogs and forums or informally by chatting with each other. And this site is secure and it's fully monitored. 
We also offer service learning opportunities. Many schools, many organizations are interested in seeing students act within the community, take their beliefs and living them out within the community, and we offer many opportunities to do that as well. So what do we expect organizations and schools to do when they join Face to Faith? What we expect them to do is to take time to teach their students and engage with them in these dialogue skills. Working with 30 countries around the world with many different organizations and school systems, what we're finding is that students are taught many things, but one thing that is consistently lacking is students are not taught dialogue skills. They're not taught to communicate with each other. They're not taught what happens if you meet someone who has a completely different world perspective, completely different belief system, lives in a completely different culture. How in the world do you begin to communicate? How do you find out about them? How do you engage in issues which you can connect in? How do you begin to see them and not be afraid of them? And this is precisely what we do. They're very specific skills. And they're really fun exercises that our teachers use around the world. We talk about tone of voice. We talk about um, asking questions that aren't loaded you know, with lots of baggage. We ask, we have students really learn to ask questions and respond questions and to go deeper and deeper and deeper into dialogue until they reach that moment of, of significance and meaning. We expect that all students around the world will engage in these so when they do meet each other through a video conference or on the online community that they'll understand that they will have these basic skills so they can connect in a very respectful way. And then we expect that each school or organization that engages in this will help their students connect with at least two different parts of the world. So students are truly exposed to people who are living in very different parts of the world. Now, besides the dialogue school skills that we teach, we also have lots of different modules where students can begin to explore some of the big issues that we have that face our globe. Wealth, Poverty, Charity is an amazing module where students can really reflect on the gap between you know, wealth and poverty. Whose responsibility is it? Is it the government's responsibility to take care of people who are, are in need? Or is it the community responsibility? Is it the responsibility of the faith communities? Or is it just everybody's individual responsibility to do that? How do we engage in response when there's an international disaster? Whose responsibility is that? Looking at the environment, whose responsibility is it to take care of the environment? Why are students motivated? Most of our students are motivated. They want to save the world. They want to save the environment. But why? What is behind that? How can they do that? How can they learn about the different environmental issues which are impacting our world? We also have special days where we engage students in huge issues like civil rights and human rights and women's rights and malaria and um, the rights of the elderly. And so students with these dialogue skills are engaging with their peers around the world on some of the biggest issues that we have and they're learning really face to face with their peers on these issues. Now the heart of what we do, and as I said, is we teach dialogue skills. We feel that it's incredibly important to have them. And so we have some essential lessons which we, we want all of the students who are engaged uh, to learn. And um, it's laid out very well on our online community. It's very clear. We also have some recommended ones where students really begin to reflect on identity. Who am I? Why is respect important? They reflect on influences. What are the major influences on my life? If I were to ask you to raise your hand and to think about what are the five major influences in your life, would you be able to talk about them? Would you be able to communicate that to someone living in Indonesia or Philippines or Palestine and talk about why those things are influencing you and why they're important in your life? And all of that helps students prepare either to engage in team blogging, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, or our video conferences where we bring students um, together in classroom settings face-to-face. Face-to-face understands dialogue as an empowering process which enables students to encounter the other in a safe environment. And this is very important. We don't just send the students out there to engage on their own. We create a safe, facilitated, moderated environment where they can begin to have this dialogue. What it does is it transforms the unfamiliar, 
We learn about people we have no idea about, people that perhaps we're afraid of, people perhaps that we've stereotyped or might have prejudice against, and they become familiar because we talk with them. We talk with them face to face. We learn about their lives. We see them as human beings. It is a profoundly reciprocal approach, and it's rooted in um, open and uh, respectful way. And so what we're constantly saying is, students, if you don't agree, that's completely fine, because we can't expect all of us in this room to agree on one thing. I think it would be hard pressed for us to come up with something that we all absolutely 100% agree on. We can't expect our students to do that either. However, we can learn how to disagree with one another in a context of respect. And so we're learning about why that other person has um, a, an idea or a feeling or an experience or a belief that is very different from mine and how I can respect that even though I completely disagree. So debate is very different from dialogue. Many of our students learn debate. We have incredible um, debate uh, classes and um, you know, clubs in schools, and that's a very, very important skill. Debate is not dialogue, and it's important that we're very clear on that. In debate, you tend to have a winner and a loser, and that's OK, because you're debating an issue. In dialogue, you have two winners. And basically what that means, it's an opportunity in a safe place. You learn from me, I learn from you. It's mutual. Why is dialogue important? And it's interesting, you know, going back and looking at half a century ago when people were really looking at, you know, the root of prejudice and how to overcome it. Um, Gordon Alport wrote, most prejudice is caused by lack of contact and knowledge. If you create opportunities for contact between two or more groups of people who hold prejudiced opinions of the other, the contact can generate a change of opinion and can help overcome prejudice. So knowledge and contact. So what we try to do is not only give students the dialogue skills, but then to give them an opportunity to meet people who have very different worldviews and perspectives. So this is what a video conference might look like. Uh, students sitting in a classroom and students on the other side of the world, but it looks like they're in the same room together. And we have facilitators. I'm one of 15 facilitators who facilitate these video conferences. And oftentimes, we truly are spanning the world. If I'm in London and one of our schools is in New York City and another one is in Amman, Jordan, then we have our tech support in India. And so everyone around the world is supporting this to make it happen. It's very exciting for our students. In standard video conferencing, you have one group talks to another group, and that's what you have. But in face-to-face, -face, we offer technical support, so you never have to worry about the connection not working. We have um, technical support for every one of our video conferences, and we have a facilitator. A facilitator is very important, and let me tell you why. I facilitated a video conference last week between a school in Quetta in Pakistan in the mountains and a school in St. Louis, okay? The video conference was all about discovering each other's community, about learning about the school day, you know, what they do during the day, you know, what they do for fun on the weekends, what's important to them. Um, and one of the questions that came up was, how could you make your community a little bit better? You know, what's one thing that you wish for your community? The students in Quetta said, I wish my community did not see as much violence as we've seen in the last couple of years. And guess what the students in St. Louis said? I wish that in the last few months that we have not seen as much violence. We've seen an incredible amount of protests, of unrest. We've seen some violence. We're not used to it. It's frightening. So students who came together on a video conference thinking that they had very, very little, you know, that, that would be similar, walked away not only realizing that their school communities actually were pretty similar, okay? They took the same classes, they did the same types of things after school, they had the same responsibilities with their families, they worked after school to earn some money. Many of them had the same similarities there, but the most profound similarity 
was that each student in those classrooms wished that their communities had not lived through violence unrest in the last few months. And then, we didn't stop there though, the students began to reflect on what can I do to make a change? How am I to respond to the violence that's happening in my community? What motivates me to make that change? And I can tell you as a facilitator, it was one of the most amazing moments to see 16 and 17 year olds having that level of conversation and making that connection. It was brilliant. You don't get that out of a textbook. You don't get that out of watching the news. You don't get that from talking with peers in your classroom where you can have amazing conversations and dialogue, but when you're connecting with someone who lives in a different part of the world, it's incredibly different. Some of our special day video conferences where we really look at some of the big issues and have students really think about them. We've got lots of resources to help uh, teachers um, and um, folks who are helping prepare students because we want our students to be prepared before we connect them. We have our incredible online community. Again, it's a very safe place so students can blog, they can ask questions, they can write about themselves and what they believe and what's important to them and really share that with others. We have team blogging, which has become incredibly uh, popular in the US, where um, schools, uh, four schools promise to blog with each other for four weeks, and they blog on certain issues, and each school will take one week and, and head up the blogs, write the blogs, and then the other schools promise to respond to them and comment. And it's an amazing way to learn how to use social media in a very respectful way. And we have a lot of um, success stories around the team blogging. What I would like to do, if it's okay, I would like to um, connect with Iyad and his colleagues in Jordan because it's nighttime there. It's about 8.20 and they've been waiting to talk with you. Uh, I will kind of interview them. They will connect uh, with us and you will have an opportunity to talk with them. So let me just pull up the link very quickly and you'll be able to see Blue Jeans and how brilliant it is. Blue Jeans is our video conference platform. Anyone can use it. If I can use it, anyone can use it. All right, it's just literally two clicks and you're in. It's a free program and we're gonna enter the meeting and we are gonna meet Iyad who has been our coordinator in Jordan we have coordinators in 10 different countries, and most of these countries are countries where there has been conflict or there is currently conflict. And so the reason we have coordinators on the ground is because we want to make sure that this program is a safe program to go into schools and organizations. Iyad has done a phenomenal job. We have over 100 schools and organizations that are engaged in this program in Jordan. So I'm gonna enter the meeting room and we're gonna meet Iyad and his colleagues. Iyad, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Iyad, it's wonderful to see you. I, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Wonderful, wonderful. And it looks like we have Janan. And we have Yusuf joining us as well. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I know it is very late, and I appreciate you taking time out of your family time uh, to be with us this extraordinary time together. Um, so what I would like to do is, Iyad, if you could talk a little bit about uh, why you joined Face to Faith. Uh, you were a teacher using Face to Faith in the classroom before you came, became coordinator. If you could talk about why this program has been important to you, Oops, it looks like Iyad just left. There we go. Iyad, if you could talk about why this program has been important to you, and then we'll hear uh, from your colleagues as well. So thank you. Go ahead. Okay, greeting everybody. Uh, I wish uh, that you enjoy your training, first of all. I'm Iyad Bosch from uh, Jordan. And uh, my colleagues, uh, Vincent Orge and Dr. Jeanette from uh, Lebanon. Uh, 
and uh, Mr. Yusuf uh, from Jordan also uh, by the way because he has a lot of internet issues. Uh, 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 in fact, uh, about the faith of the about faith to faith. Five years ago, we received one of our things. This program was two days long, but it had a great impact of me and my colleagues from the same school. Iyad, we're experiencing a little bit of bandwidth hit, it looks like, in your region. Um, if you're still there, I think if you mute your um, camera, then perhaps we'll be able to hear you a little bit more clearly. Thank you. Jinan, are you able to, to tell us a little bit about your work in Lebanon? Uh, looks like Iyad is experiencing a little bit of bandwidth hit, but we'd love to hear about your work in Lebanon. Thank you. Hello, Kristen. Of course, I'm ready. Uh, I hope Mr. Iyad can join us uh, soon. I would like to share with you my experience in face-to-face. -face. In fact, uh, I've, uh, you know, Lebanese context, uh, the war, and uh, which is due to the unacceptance of differences and especially religions. This makes us all, as educators, think of a step to change. And uh, throughout my researches, I'm preparing some, some researches due to, uh, for sustainable development and how to uh, prepare students to think of a good future, peaceful future. I met with uh, Ms. Sara Dayek, who introduced Face to Faith to us, and we were so happy to have such an easy curriculum to be integrated into our uh, lessons especially uh, I'm integrating it in sciences, and my students are liking it so much. Uh, in fact, it helps us not only in directing them into a more peaceful future and a good civilized dialogue, it uh, helps them to be more disciplined in school, and this also uh, serves for different targets. Uh, so it, uh, it helps us, and it has a big effect in our school first, by uh, directing the community into a more peaceful vision, peaceful uh, future, uh, believing in human rights. Uh, everybody, although our differences, we have to communicate, we have to uh, accept others in their differences just as we respect ourselves. So, and we are implementing it. Uh, you know, um, the main uh, important, we believe that schools, they must have video conferences and they have to communicate globally, is first to know the differences and the similarities between uh, students all over the world and from different cultures, and to uh, provide the true picture about their community. It's not only the media to, to uh, give uh, the picture for our community, so it's good from our students' perspectives to give this uh, vision, the problems, everything about our culture. We are so happy about this uh, project, really, and one of the stories of the impact of this project in fact, we have uh, different religions uh, in our community, and we don't usually get into teaching religion through this uh, curriculum. So I was discussing the uh, faith uh, concept, and uh, one, student's, uh, one student said that, yes, faith to, faith to me is that when Maxim Shaya, the Lebanese uh, uh, adventurers, get out, uh, climb the Everest mountain. And this was one of uh, really uh, exciting answer for a 13-year-old girl who, who really uh, made a common uh, view of faith, uh, irrespective of the religion. So I believe that it was wonderful. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much for, for sharing your experience and that wonderful story, uh, which is always just, you know, we take to heart when we hear the words directly from our youth and how profound and how much we can learn from them. So thank you, and thank you for your amazing work that you're doing in Lebanon in oftentimes very difficult um, situations. Let's see if we can bring Iyad back in. Iyad, um, can you hear me and, and see me okay? Of course I can. I'm sorry for this uh, internet issue. Today and uh, it's really kind of okay. So I can, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, my my cousin also in the debate and give him uh, some feedback from his side. If you please, sorry if you please. I really ask to be here and to be in this meeting is for sure. And uh, the pleasure is us really to join you with this. Oh, that's too bad. Sometimes we do experience bandwidth hits, and it Sorry. looks like they are certainly experiencing that right now. Uh, Iyad, I'm wondering if you can just turn off your, your video. If you can turn off your video, I think that we can hear your voice. And as early birds in the ground, uh, we were invited by the Baptist, Baptist to join this, this program, and we were willing to yes, At the beginning, uh, it was just about activities and some fun with some students. Later on, we find that the program is more than just uh, cooking. It is also about it. It's also about uh, using your students and having the abilities of talking, communicating your skills, and even knowing this sometimes as you know, as an individual person, that to know how to talk to others, you have to know about yourself more. And this was the chance that was given to our students to know how to uh, As I always use it in my, uh, in my talk about the face to face, uh, students always uh, have something in the school curriculum uh, to join or to uh, integrate the face to face uh, activities. And that's really uh, the task that we need in our school and students need to do. So. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing with us about your experience. We're, we're getting some uh, interference. There is so something it's, about festivals. It's a little bit hard uh, to hear you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask if Yusuf uh, can just say a few things. And then um, perhaps you can turn off your video. I think that will help us make the connection a little bit better. Um, and then we will have an opportunity to see if um, our audience here has any specific questions for you. Uh, so Yusuf, uh, can you tell us just a little bit about your experience? Thank you. Is mute microphone. Yeah. Please. I think you have you you have unmuted your microphone. If you can quickly say a couple of things about the program, and then I think it's too hard yeah. to hear you. Iyad, I want to thank you very much. I'm sorry we're having some bandwidth hits here. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, for all of you for being here. Uh, I know it's late in the evening. I want to thank you, and I look forward to connecting with you soon. But thank you for sharing your experiences with us today. Thank you.
So as you can see, in different parts of the world, sometimes we do get hit with bandwidth. Um, it's unfortunate because we had a very, very clear connection with him earlier. And I don't know if it's because it's later on in the evening, um, but generally we have you know, really good connections with, with our schools, and so our students are able to connect. Um, but their experiences on the ground are, are absolutely incredible, and, and how hard that they have had to work. Um, you know, Janan in Lebanon, with everything that's going on in Lebanon, and, and with Iyad and Jordan and with his teachers, um, bringing this program to schools, oftentimes where parents and administrators and teachers are afraid of it, and yet they're willing to say, this is important enough for our students to, to meet uh, one another. And so right now, I think would be a great time. Do you have any general questions um, about what we do, about our program? And then we'll go on to, to Craig and Netta. Yes, go ahead. I, I just want kind of a logistics question. Sure. Fit into the day. Do, do the schools incorporate our certain, do certain classes incorporate this into their curriculum, into their day? How does it work, or is it after school? We are such a flexible program that uh, teachers use it in many different ways. Public schools in the U.S. tend to use it in social studies curriculum, and so um, we do see that uh, social studies curriculum where it is used. Um, we also see it in before school clubs and after school clubs. Uh, there are some uh, school districts that have a world religions course or a world histories course. We see it there as well. But we also have English teachers, language teachers who use it. And in different parts of the world, you know, we see it sometimes in, um, you know, kind of life skills classes. So again, it's such a flexible program and the skills that we teach are dialogue so they can really fit into any classroom discussion. Exactly, exactly. So if you're on the East Coast, like we are here, we have a much um, greater number of countries that we can connect with. We can connect uh, from here all the way to India um, and Pakistan, which is amazing. And generally our video conferences would be before school. Um, on the West Coast, they connect a lot with, with Australia and Philippines and Indonesia and Guam, and, and they have some opportunities to do that. But I think um, that's why team blogging has become so popular, because it's asynchronous. And so they can blog anytime they want, and the students will answer them, and they can connect with a greater diversity. Yes, go ahead. Is there a professional development component for teachers, and can you tell me what that looks like in advance of a school undertaking this project? Absolutely. So there are some places where we actually go uh, and do trainings, and um, you know I'm having a training in New York City with um, a number of teachers on Friday. So we'll go up and offer you know either a full day workshop or three hour workshop. We also do a lot of individual Skype calls, um, and, and so we're very hands-on that way. And so if you're interested in introducing this you know, program, then I could get on the phone with you, and, and I'll work with, as many, with you as many times as you want uh, to make sure you have all your questions answered. Um, we have a ton of teacher resources, videos, everything right on our website, and so a lot of teachers will, will just go on the website and learn everything they can through the, the kind of how-to video conferences. Um, in the U.S., we also offer um, professional video conferences uh, for teachers who are getting started. We do that once a month. Um, and then we also have a help desk, and so you can email your questions. So we really try and give a lot of support. You talked about the hesit hesitancy of breaking into a public school, for instance. Um, how, how is that usually done in the United States? Do you do it with a champion, an educator, a volunteer? Um, what's the normal course? What do you see to be the most successful? We are going to a lot of the Council for the Social Studies, um, uh, you know, conferences around the country. We're going to be at the National Council for the Social Studies. They've been very, very supportive of the work that we're doing. Um, you know, it's really word of mouth. I think the biggest challenge in the U.S. is letting people know that we're here, that it's a free program. We have everything ready, linked up, ready to go. You know, I think there are a lot of um, other organizations who, who offer video conferencing, but I think what makes us unique is, is that we, we offer the skills that go along with it and everything is facilitated and moderated. Um, so sometimes it's word of mouth, sometimes you know, it's conferences, sometimes it's, you know, we just get out there as often as we can. Any other questions? Yeah. 
I just had, I, I, yeah, I just had uh, also kind of a technical uh, question, but how do you deal with the um, language differences? Is English the only working language for all the students? And so the students in different countries are only, you know, can only participate if they speak English fluently enough, or there is some kind of a translation services provided for the students as well? That's a really good question. Uh, right now, what we're doing is offering video conferences in Arabic and in English. And most of the video conferences are in English. And you would be absolutely floored. And I am every time I get on a video conference with, with a school where the students are speaking English in their third or fourth language. And they're speaking sometimes better than our own students are. It's unbelievable. In fact, that school in Pakistan, um, in Quetta, they were talking about their day. And they get home you know, around 3 o'clock. And our US students are kind of nodding. And then they go do some sports. And our US students are nodding. And then the, the student said, well, then we go back to school for two hours to learn English from six to eight. And you should have seen the looks on our students. They're like, what? You know, we're, we're on our video games or watching TV or whatever. And the students are literally back in school for two hours learning English. So as, um, you know, as we continue to have a number of schools in different languages and asking for that, we will certainly find facilitators who can facilitate that. We have an Italian facilitator right now. Uh, we have a lot of schools from Italy uh, who have joined the program, and um, they like to have an Italian facilitator. And so it, it works really well right now. Thank you. Should we, yeah, how about one more question, and, and then we'll move on to, to Craig and, and Netta. Go ahead. We could certainly talk with you about where our schools are located, absolutely. So very happy to share that with you. In terms of technology, um, again, it's very different. So in, um, you know, I'll go back to Pakistan again. We have three coordinators there. And the, the coordinator in the Sindh province, uh, he will literally take a laptop with him and take it in the back of his car and go from school to school to school um, because they do not have the infrastructure. Um, there are some areas where there is a local business or someone who supports getting the basic infrastructure for that. Um, so we work in amazing locations, but with very little. I mean, you really don't need much more than, you know, a, a laptop with a camera, and it can be a very ex inexpensive one, and microphone as well. And we're able to work in schools. And actually, we just um, did a, a program, a training program in um, a, a refugee camp. In, um, in Jordan, and those students will be joining us soon. So how amazing for our students to connect with students who are living in a refugee camp. Pretty extraordinary. Um, Craig. OK, well, good afternoon. And before I start talking about uh, Face to Faith, I think it, it's important to um, say how grateful I am to be here today. I lived in Brazil from 1999 to 2005. When I came back to the United States, the World Affairs Councils that I joined up with were a consistent uh, source of inspiration and, and networking and, and, and great uh, resources for myself as a teacher back then before I went to the dark side of administration. But um, I want to give a special thanks to uh, Springfield Mass and Cynthia Melcher for my first Council and then over to Bill Clifford in Boston and now at Amanda Stamp in Washington, D.C. So thank you for all the work you do. I'm sure I'm, there's tons of teachers and administrators around uh, your council that feel the same way. So thank you very much. Um, with the risk of being labeled someone who is simply the master of the obvious, I think it's important to make this claim. And that claim is it's easy to support programs that you believe in and that you love, right? And I, I, I believe and I love face to faith. Uh, I love it so much that I wish I knew about it and or had it when I was in, in the classroom. Right? And I believe, about, I believe in it enough so that when I, whenever I can, wherever I can, I bring it up to fellow educators to say this is the program you should have in your school system. To the point that um, about a year ago, I authored a blog post. I, I, I have a blog, the Global History Educator, and that's the title of the blog. The best, <laughs> the best global education instructional program your school should have. Right? So what I want to do today is kind of uh, support that claim, and I want to outline some, some approaches and some strategies and some challenges that I had as, as a Fairfax County Social Studies Specialist in growing the program within Fairfax and in quite possibly beyond, right? So um, 
when I came to, like, three years ago, you know, it, my predecessor had already kind of laid the groundwork for this program, Face to Faith. Uh, and indeed, Charles had already demystified uh, any kind of challenges around the term faith. Because you, if, if you go to public schools, you're going to get that pushback. You're going to get that question mark. Uh, this is a touchy subject, teaching about faith or in religion in schools. And actually, it's not. Right? To the point that um, I have not had th any questions about it in my three years in this position. Right? There's, 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 there's concern about it. I put, I put it this way. The, the program does not teach dogma. Right? And in order to kind of build my capacity, I would go, I would go into our, our schools that use it, which at the start were only two. There were only two teachers. There's 25 high schools in Fairfax County. Only two teachers were using it, and it was relegated to the comparative religion elective. Right? So that's, that was only about seven schools that even offered that course. Right? Since then, and, and Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think we're up to about nine or ten schools, and the program is no longer carries that limitation of just a comparative religion elective. It's used in world history courses now. It's used in AP human geography. It's used in AP government. It's used in government. And it's, it's such a heart-lifting program. It's, it, it really nailed me when I went into, if you, if you know the term self-contained special ed class, right? Um, this really was, this, seeing uh, the teacher at McLean do, us, do a self-contained face-to-face program with the Muslim Christian school north of Jerusalem, was one of the best experiences I ever saw in my life. Right? Eight kids who, you know, teachers might say, oh, my kids can't do it. Well, so you're saying your kids can't, the self-contained special ed kids can. That, that really puts, puts teachers in, a, in a, you know, a reflective moment, right, to say the, to say the least. Um, this was a quote, the second bullet, is a quote from one of the, one of the students um, in my first in my first face-to-face um, observation I did, and this was at Chantilly High School, and they were, they were part, they were, I think it was, I believe it was India, and, I, and they had one of those moments, you mentioned Kristen, about this synchronicity between uh, the same experiences, but it wasn't as, as, as tragic. The, uh, one, of the, one of the kids from Chantilly asked the kid in India and said, you know, what are some of the things that are, that's going on around your city, you know, and, and the, you know, the Indian kids get together and they kind of elect who's going to go respond to it, they go up to the microphone and the kid goes traffic, right? So if you know the DC, DC public schools and are in the area, that's the exact name. Everybody bursts off, you know, oh, so it, it, it brings this connection. And, it, and it, I use the word demystify the other, um, which is a huge part of 21st century ed, right, in global education. Um, that's the blog post if, in case you're interested. But um, some comments about why I think it's so great and why I believe in it. I think it looks kind of blurry, but maybe we can work it out. Um, from my point of view as an instructional specialist, right, and curriculum specialist, each of those six circles, and I'll, and I'll read them to you, um, talk to what is on the contemporary landscape of, of education, right, especially at the high school, at K to 12, right? Um, the use of technology in the classroom, top circle, and then clockwise, uh, addressing global competencies of global citizenship or global awareness, or whatever global term your school system is using. Third, uh, celebrating critical thinking over rote memorization. Okay. On the bottom, six o'clock. Um, use of respectful discourse. You guys, you, Krista mentioned dialogue. Respectful discourse is, is, a, is a key term in contemporary ed as well. Uh, it's student-centered, and uh, to, 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 for an anecdote on that, when I first went in, I saw my first um, you know, video conferencing, two things stood out. One was the teacher is totally off screen. Right? You saw that, I think, in the still shot. Uh, she was, she's behind the camera, kind of motivating, suggesting, prompting kids to come up. Who's going to talk next? Who's going who's to respond to that question? You wanted to ask that question before? Come on, let's, let's get it going. And the, the moderator from Face to Faith. Um, it's, it's such an integral part. It, it, it unburdens the classroom teacher. And the moderator is so skilled at, at negotiating time and pace and, and content and equality in the voice of the students. It really stands out for that student-centered approach. And then this trans, the, term, the idea of transferable skill set, right? That the dialogue, the critical thinking that they take in this class, can it translate beyond the classroom? And the answer for me is yes. So when I, when I, when I approach teachers, and, and, if, and, and by the way, if you approach any administrators or educators, I think a great approach is to find out where they are. 
right, in, this, in this process. Uh, ah, technology, ah, I, can't, I can't use that. So okay, now I know what your weakness is. Don't worry about it. All you need is a camera, a laptop, a projector, and a microphone. Can you get that? Oh yeah, sure, uh, we'll get it down the hall. I remember going into, the, 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 the camera was, was taped to a, kind of like, like, a, like a yardstick and, and propped it up against it, and it worked. It worked for them, right? That, that was their camera setup. And that was the first time I'm sure he's gotten a little bit more you know, a, a conventional uh, beyond that. Um, you, you might get the pushback about faith, right? Time is always gonna be, a, is always gonna be an issue. I don't have time. I, I that, if you go to a school and they have a state test, this is the, an AP test. The AP Human Geography, they're doing it after the test, but at least they're doing it. They're doing it at least once. Right, and that's the goal. That from, uh, one of my goals is to have every school, 25 high schools, do at least have at least one teacher doing it once uh, throughout the year, because colleague pressure is fantastic. Right? I make sure that whenever I leave, I always ask a student, the students, what do you what do you think about this? Is this something you're going to remember? And invariably, it's a chorus of yes. Right, and then typically. There's always one or two students who say, and I wish my other teachers did things like this. Right? And, that, and that is fantastic. Um, Charles Haynes has been, has been uh, a great resource. Uh, I, you know, I work directly with department chairs, and I brought him in my, my, one of my first meetings to department chairs to present this with a, t with, a t with a teacher who does it, to have that perspective. And then you've been back, I think, nonstop, right, regarding workshops on the event, you or someone from, from, a, from face to face. Um, if the schools you go to have a school board session that spotlights instruction, emphasizes something great that's going on in the school, guess what I picked when I was asked, Craig, what's going on in social studies? Well, face to faith. School board ate it up. Loved it, right? Their video on that blog post is, is public domain. It's, it's part of the Fairfax County Public School school board meetings. It was, it, uh, it was it's, uh, won them over and, and celebrated it. This is a great thing to do. So um, maybe I just want to finish off before we get, because I know we're, we're tight on time a wee bit, but I wasn't, I wasn't actually sure how to close this. And, and, I, and I decided that I wanted to, to bring up uh, about a year ago, a international relations professor uh, wrote a op-ed piece from Johns Hopkins that there's no such thing as a global citizen. Global citizen, it, the term doesn't exist. And in, and in turn began to kind of attack schools K to 12, maybe K to 16, that are promoting this term. And I think he got it wrong because of his training, his, his international relations background, which takes the nation state as the program of how you deal with the world. Global citizenship and global competencies in education is not about legal distinction of a nation. It's about a worldview. Right? It's about a worldview that you can be part of a country and still have a view that goes beyond those borders, that uh, uh, talks about bigger concepts which the face-to-face -face, face -face modules talk about. When I go in and I see there's no talk of dogma, there's talk about the environment, there's talk about respect, there's talk about what you do at your school, what I do at my school, and in the process, it talks to what Edward Said um, presented to us prior to his death in the book Orientalism, the idea of the other, right? One of the best things this does is that it takes away the feeling of you there, me here, and we're different. Right? And I think that's one of the main goals Tony Blair talked about in his presentation. And it's the reason why one of the best skills, I, I, it's one of the best skills and the reason why that I still believe in it, still love it, still support this program, and I hope you do with your councils as well. Thank you very much. to be cognizant of our time and also a few things that were covered that I was going to speak about, but I've integrated Face to Faith into the curriculum that I teach students. I work with students from all over the Bay Area, so not just from one school. I have students from private schools, public schools, magnets, charters, from Napa to Silicon Valley to Berkeley and everywhere in between. At the World Affairs Council of Northern California, we have a pretty robust education program, working with about 300 to 500 Bay Area students and teachers 
provide scholarships to study abroad, summer programs, and programs this school year. The point is that we were already quite busy and we already have a lot of things going, but Face to Faith was so worth the effort put in and so easy to implement that we were able to add it into an already full schedule. So as an educator, I was really looking for a way to connect my students outside of the classroom to their peers abroad. I had looked at other online programs, other initiatives, but there was just never a really good fit. And so as it's been mentioned before, I think that you can learn so much more when you talk to people that have different opinions and talk to your peers. And so I wanted to bring that one level up and do it internationally. So Faith to Faith, Face to Faith was really critical in this mission. Um, I personally don't know teachers in India, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and so they're able to make those connections for you. They have such a network of diverse schools that they're easy to, it's easy to make those connections and find partners to do these video conferences with. The way it's worked for me is um, I've emailed a coordinator and said the time that I wanted to do it, the module I wanted to do, and they're so fantastic there that they make it work. There are other ways to do it. You can do it on the online platform, but I've just always been very <laughs> impressed with their ability to help me get it done. Um, another issue that I face, which was brought up in the questions, is that I have a limited time, space, time frame in which I can do these. I meet with students from 5.30 to 7.30 on Thursdays once every two weeks. But because of their deep network, they're able to find schools to participate. Um, as mentioned previously, it's low cost and low tech. It cost the council about $27 to implement face to face. All that was was buying an external microphone. I brought my laptop from home, which has a camera. We connected to the council's internet. We tend to use, we tend to shy away from Wi Fi and use the older plug in connection. And then we already had a screen and a projector. So it was so easy on the technical front. And then there's also the support. So before we even connect with another school, we ran through everything using the tech support in India. We connected, tested the microphone, tested the camera, tested blue jeans. And then even the day of the video conference, the administrators log in early, check everything, and then we're good to go. In one of the video conferences we had, we lost our partner in the Philippines for a moment, but then we brought them back online and continued as if nothing had happened. An example of one of the conferences we did was connecting with the Ateneo de Lilo Santa Maria Catholic School, which is located in the Philippines. And we first prepared by thinking about our communities. So because I have students from all different types of schools and all different communities, it was really enriching for our classroom to figure out how do we connect in our communities? What do we think of? What are some things that we value? What are some things that we want to change? So we looked at it first as a Bay Area perspective. And this is a lesson that was just literally used from the face-to-faith -face curriculum that they provided with us. So what we did was we made trees for the various communities and then used leaves to decorate them. So in terms of the Bay Area, students brought up things such as they feel that our community is very progressive. They feel that there's a lot of techies and innovation going on. Students also noticed the prevalence of hipsters in San Francisco, which a lot of people wrote us as well. And so it was helpful for them to organize their thoughts first. Then moving on with school, all of them were in high school. So they brought up things such as the competition that sometimes occurs in trying to earn grades rather than learning. They brought up the variety of different clubs that each campus has. They brought up that sometimes it can be clicky, but other classroom communities also allow them to move past that. So in order to discuss our communities, we had to discover them first. So this is one of the takeaways that a student had from Lowell High School in San Francisco, which is the most competitive high school in San Francisco in terms of the public schools. So I'll let you read it, but a couple of the things that I wanted to point out was a lot of the students in this conference pointed out that the students at, in the Philippines were very comfortable talking about their faith, whereas in their high schools it's never discussed. It's almost a taboo topic. So it was important for them to practice talking about it. 
And they were also just overwhelmed with the amount of respect and curiosity that the Filipino students showed to them. And this is the screenshot of everyone saying goodbye and waving towards their new friends. Um, we're down in the bottom corner. Another video conference that we did was to Jakarta, and we were able to connect with an Islamic high school there. And we also did the same module, talking about communities and the role of faith. It was a different group of students, so I wanted us to start at the beginning and make sure that we had laid the groundwork. Um, so we did a lot of the same activities. We focused on the principles of dialogue, allowing the students to learn how to respectfully talk about their opinions and how to make sure that when they're speaking, they're representing their personal views, not the group dynamic. I think in English we often have a, we often talk about things in, the, in you know, the plural first person. We say, oh, we believe, we think, we're so, um, whatever, which doesn't always happen in other languages. So it was really key to even put in that one lesson that when you talk about things that are especially important types of, that when we talk about things that have to do with faith and communities, it's important to really say that I believe, I think, I do this. So we had our hour-long video conference, and this is another reflection that was there. Um, this is a student from Berkeley High School. So as her reflection states, it really went by quickly. An hour can seem like a long time to students, but it often takes them a few minutes to really get into it and to feel comfortable asking and answering questions. But then afterwards, they don't want to stop. And so it's just a really amazing experience. Um, they often know that they learn a lot and that they really feel connected. So I found that it's just a really unique experience that even though we don't get to do it very often, the students remember and cherish. So at the council in Northern California, my plans are to do more video conferences I've just been so blown away by the experience that I'd like to share it more with my students. And to utilize the online community, our, my students are really busy, and so having this online community allows them to access their peers around the world on their own schedule. They can go on when they're done doing their homework. They can go on before school, whenever is best for them. And then also just to integrate the standards into my lesson plans, we cover a lot of the same topics, but they have so many great lesson plans already there that if I can integrate some of their activities into it, it prepares us for the next video conference and then also gives me some great ideas of things that I can do to make my classroom more lively. And then in terms of next steps for anyone else that's interested, um, it's really quite easy. You can sign up at their website. You just have to register and then they will send you all of the information that you need. Everything is located um, on their secure website that is monitored by teams in the US, UK, and also by teachers as well. So a lot of parents can be concerned about online safety, and this is something that face-to-face -face takes really seriously. So this is the website. Um, it's a really exciting place to have dialogue, and as I mentioned, one of the things that was most important to me is that it's secure and safe. And lastly, this is the amazing team in the US that will answer any question, no matter how simple you think it may be or how, um, how difficult you think it may be. So it's a team of three, but they do amazing work and respond very quickly. So I think that is what we had prepared, so we'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, for the remainder of the time. Thank you. You know, to, uh, to, uh, to children as well as to all of us as, as, as we watch them grow up. But, but most districts these days look at it a little bit different in terms of what are the students taking away. Is there a rubric or some way that we measure the, um, you know, what the students are getting out of this? 
it's very important to us that we are doing what we say we're doing. And, and so what we're looking for is attitudinal and behavioral change from our students. So we're currently working with Oxford University and um, they have helped us put together a survey, a baseline survey, and then future surveys. And so before students engage in face to faith, they take the baseline survey and the questions are all about you know, diversity and, and openness. And um, then they take it again after their first video conference and then they will be taking it again after the first year. Um, we just started this about six months ago, so we're just kind of gathering the baseline surveys now. Before this, we worked with Warwick University in the UK, and they did case studies and, and you know, went out and interviewed and, 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 and you know, wrote, you know, um, just reflections on how the program was really changing um, the youth and, and their attitudes towards others. Um, but we realized as the program grows bigger, we need to make sure that, that we have a bigger um, and more sustainable kind of evaluation process. So we're working with Oxford now, and so in a year we should be able to see the results of that. But it's important that we're doing what we say we're doing, and if we're not, then we need to tweak the program. Um, and so we're, we're very conscious of that. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Hi, I don't have a question so much as a, a quick comment following up on what Netta was saying and addressing one of the questions earlier. Uh, I'm with the Seattle World Affairs Council and we've worked with Face to Faith as well. Um, and our education programs, we have a, a focus, um, you know, we do some work with students, but the most of, most of our work by far is with teachers. And we have been connecting teachers with other teachers um, around the world. We did that at the Washington State Council on Social Studies, um, I think last year. Um, connecting a, a network, a, a workshop of teachers there with teachers abroad and in two, just under two weeks we're having a professional development workshop for teachers. They'll be getting clock hours um, by attending our workshop and it is on face to faith but not the, the mechanics of it but using global dialogue to promote peace and understanding and we are connecting our Seattle teachers with teachers in the Philippines and with India overcoming that big time change um, to show these teachers how they can use face-to-faith uh, -face and how they can promote uh, dialogue in their classrooms. We're also using some U.S. teachers who have been Seattle teachers who have uh, familiar with the project as well. So there's been a lot of talk about students and that's great, but there are also avenues you can work with teachers as well. Absolutely, and thank you so much for that. It is really important because I think teachers who are interested in this often feel that maybe they're alone in their school or their organization, and so to be able to, to build those relationships with colleagues around the world is so exciting. So, And thank you for the amazing work that you're doing in Seattle. It's really exciting to see that blossom as a program. Right, right here, question, a, a couple of questions. The, the first is, um, do, does this also work during the summer? Because during the summer we kind of ramp up and have a whole slew of interns come in. Is there the possibility of having this a summer program? And then the second thing, I can see, I mean, we have so many high schools that are connected. We have a global scholars program now with almost 70 kids. I could see us incorporating this, but are there grants that might support this? Because I could also see a lot of management involved in, in this. Do you know of any organizations or foundations that would support this kind of initiative? That's a really good question. I don't. However, we, to be able to offer this as a free program to schools all around the world, um, we do a lot of fundraising and people are really excited to see that our students are connecting. And I think they're seeing it especially, you know, in this time uh, where we look and seeing what, what is really happening around the world when we see a lot of anti-American sentiment, when we see a lot of Islamophobia, we see a lot of that in the world. I think people are excited that our students are having these opportunities to connect and, and to, to put a human face on, on people that we're only learning about in the news and in a way that isn't really reflective of societies. Um, and so I think you probably would, would find an openness to support this kind of program. In terms of the cost of the program, it doesn't cost anything. You know, in, it just is, you know, getting a laptop and making sure that that, but for, you know, bringing your students together if there are costs that are incurred uh, with that, you know, I'm sure that people would be open to support it. We found a lot of support for the program and that's why we're able to offer it for free. Um, what was your second question? The summertime, yes, we have schools um, 
that are open all around the world. So, you know, a huge chunk of schools, especially in Europe, are going to be uh, closed uh, during, you know, the, the typical summer break. But we have schools in Philippines and Indonesia and many other parts of the world which are open during the summertime. And so we continue to go all year long, especially with team blogging. I think that will continue to be big in the summertime as well. But we do have video conferences all year long. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I would explore the Longview Foundation. Uh, and the other category was a little added in the That's a great idea. All right. Any other questions? <clears throat> You've spoken a lot about the educational organizations. How have the various religious organizations reacted to this process? Because it seems to some extent to be leading towards a dissipation of their control and direction of their religions. Do you want to talk about that? Well, I can speak about the United States. In the United States, the reception from various religious communities has been very enthusiastic. Evangelicals, Roman Catholics, Jewish communities in various uh, perspectives, uh, Islamic communities. Um, I chair the Committee on Religious Liberty, which uh, is an incredible, uh, used to be at the National Council of Churches, and now we house it at the, at the museum. And everybody's pretty much at the table, and they all know about this. And you can just go around the room. Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims, Catholics, Protestants, Jews. Uh, we have Native American representatives at the, we had the meeting earlier this week, so I'm thinking of it. And, uh, we had the secular coalition there, so it's, it's, it's pretty much everybody at the table. And all think that I've talked to about this and I've talked to the committee about this, love this. I think that they actually think, I mean, from very much very conservative Christian groups all the way to very progressive groups, they really think this is in their best interest. Why? Because this is not about religion. This is about citizenship. This is about working together across differences. That's what they get. And it's very important to underscore that this, this particular program is in no way meant to in some way, you know, talk about religion is better than non-religion or one religion is better than the other religion. It's really about how do all religions get to assert what they are, who they are, how they think, and people of no religion, what they think in a safe environment. It's extraordinary. We don't do that much. But we should be doing it. But giving the students the opportunity to do that, I heard a UK student in one of my first video conferences say, you know, he said, well, actually, I'm an atheist. And so this is what I think about this issue. Now, I think that's so liberating and refreshing. And I can tell you that my very conservative religious friends on the Christian side and my other friends that I work with, they love to hear that kind of conversation because they really want students to be free to say what they think and believe to others. That's, and so it's, it, it, it works. It works for all of them is more important than it works for me. It works for them. <laughs> yes, one more question, and then we're probably at the end of our time. But we'll be around afterwards. And I have some brochures, too, if you're interested. I would really hate to end this on an argumentative note. but. Uh, and I'm 100% I'm in favor of what you're doing, and I will support it in our council with all of my ability. But this does not sound like the religious fundamentalists in my part of the world, that they would be welcoming this kind of uh, interaction. And so I, I cannot believe that you have not had any blowback of any kind from the people in my old part of the world, you know, like down in Oklahoma. So. Have you really not received any kind of feedback? You know, I, I, I've been a, uh, on the front lines of culture wars a long time, so I hear you loudly and clearly. I have been there. I've negotiated some pretty horrible conflicts in local communities over religion and schools particularly. <laughs> so I have scars to prove that, that you're right, that there are some people who don't come to the table, who won't come to the table. So I know that. Now, so far, whoever those folks are have not attacked this program. Let's knock some wood here. Uh, what, our, what my strategy has always been in bringing people together across differences, and we have about nine agreements so far 
that we brokered on religion in schools, on religious holidays, on equal access, on how do you deal with the Bible in public schools. And what my strategy has always been to have on the list voices from the right and the left that you can look and see have strong support across the spectrum, knowing that not everybody's going to want to be on the list. But if some are on the list that represent that voice, it gives safety to the, to the work. So there are some who won't go on. I, that's right. So the American Center for Law and Justice, which was founded out of Pat Robertson's outfit and Christian Coalition, they're on our advisory group. But there may be some other groups that represent that same constituency who don't want to be on the advisory group and may not like this. I don't know. They haven't spoken out if they do. But they see ACLJ on the list and they think, oh, this must be OK. Christian Educators Association, on the list. Represent very conservative Christians who work in public schools. They're on the list. Uh, Christian Legal Society, very supportive. Network of born again evangelical lawyers around the country. They're on the list, right? Now on the other side, there are a lot of folks in the culture wars that beat, have beat up on you know, stuff that I've done over the years and tried to, you know. So I'm very careful to make sure they're on the list too. That's why the ACLU, you know, they, they, they're important to have watchdogs in this country on these issues. And they're very careful about these kinds of things. They don't want a Trojan horse coming into public schools, you know, promoting religion, right? Uh, and so they're on the list. There may, not, there may be some folks that are represented in that side that won't like this approach or thinks too much talk about religion. But if they see the ACLU thinks it's, it's uh, solid, they're, they're usually OK. So that's the strategy. You're absolutely right. Can't get everybody. I've never been able to get everybody to the table. But on the Teacher's Guide to Religion in Public Schools that we did a few years ago that President Clinton actually sent out to, it's been more than a few now, sent out to every public school in the United States. Why? Because it's safe. And it has 21 organizations on it. And somewhere on there, you can see yourself. Christian Legal Society, American Jewish Committee, Islamic Society of North America, US Catholic Conference of Bishops. You know, you can see yourself somewhere, even if not everybody's there. And that's the strategy. So you're right. We live in a culture war time. And things can trigger reaction. But so far, I think we've done the right thing by having this strong advisory council representative of various perspectives and carried out the program, more important than what it looks like, carried out the program in ways that are absolutely consistent with the First Amendment. So if someone does take a close look, they can say, oh, it's OK. I'm coming with the mic to the front of the room. Um, Kristen, Charles, Netta, Craig, thank you very much. Be hold your applause for a second. I just wanted to comment briefly that you know there are a lot of applications for video conferencing. I was preventing my development chair from uh, interjecting on global health, and they just did, done something in Pittsburgh on Ebola and that issue. And we could have video conferencing on national security issues. You've touched on religious freedom and, and intercultural understanding. Uh, you do massively great work. And um, we need to try and take risks, even with technology that is slightly imperfect. But you know, you know, Charles and, of course, Tony Blair, you've explained very well why there's a need to do this. And Kristen, you gave us the, the, the story about what it is and how it can work. And you guys, Craig and Netta, um, in our system, working with our systems, show that we can adopt this stuff. It is not you know, an essential piece for the World Affairs Councils, but it's, it would be a great one in our portfolio. I mean, it, it's, it is easy to use. And, it, and most importantly, it, it, it inspires and provides a great experience that will be remembered. And teachers, students, you don't necessarily know where they are, or when they're going to emerge for you, but they will be believers. <laughs> to use a, a religious word, they will be believers. They'll be believers in us. They'll be believers in the World Affairs Councils. And that's why we wanted to present this program. So I'm really grateful that you all have come to talk with us today. Thank you so much.